Well, this morning, we are focusing on the second value that we believe will cause us to have a kingdom lifestyle. And I want to pray that God will help me this morning and you, as you have to listen to this, that it will hit home in every heart. So please join me in a word of prayer as we will launch into the word of God now. Father, please come and help us by your spirit to understand whatever you want us to grasp today. Open our understandings, please, Lord, for your wonderful word. And Lord, that we will be doers of your word and not only hearers. That's so important. So please, Lord, come and make your word plain to us. We ask that in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, are you okay? You settled in there? Can you just give me a smile, please? I just want to know I'm not dealing with a hostile crowd yet. You know, just a smile, please. Folks, we started off last week with our series for this term, and it's all about kingdom lifestyle. We said we've heard a lot about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, and the king in the first term, but now it's time to put it to practice, to, to actually get into the nitty-gritty, how do we live this? How does it touch our lives and shape our lives? And we've come to this conclusion that your lifestyle, the style with which you live, is a direct result of the values in your heart, the things that you would live and die for. And we've begun to speak about them. And the first one we emphasized last week was we live from a value that says God is at the center of our lives. Jesus is number one. That's the value we started off last week. From that place, the rest of your life and your values can be settled from no other place. But this morning we want to launch into the second value that we as a church hold to. And it is actually very close to some of the things I mentioned last week. And I've entitled it this, the wonderful word of God. Our second value is that we value and put God's word in the highest place as kingdom believers. And so I want to talk to you about the Bible today, the word of God, because it's something that must enjoy a place of authority above everything else in our lives. And I trust at the end of this service, there will be a new love sparked in your heart and a new appreciation and a new reverence and respect for the Word of God. We need to know that there's tremendous authority in the Word of God and what it can do. We're going to get into that. But firstly, by way of introduction, just a little bit of a testimony from my own life. Many of you have heard it, but I love telling it, so here we go. As a young man, and truly a young man, I was actually still in school. I didn't know much about the Bible and Jesus and all of that. I'd given my life to Jesus like many of you might have, but, but I, I've not really, really, really grown yet. And then a friend of me invited me, and you know, now remember, I'm just kind of, you know, 17, around that age in my life, um, and he said, come, and, come to a presentation by a man on the Bible, the Word of God. Now, we are Christians in this place, so, you know, I must kind of be honest with you, we, you know, that, that's what we do in church here. I just thought, my first thought then, boring. Mm. I was a Christian, but I, I must say I didn't pay much attention to that invitation. I thought he was, he's trying to drag me off to some other seminar where the man's going to talk about how old the Bible is and the archaeological findings and then get into the deep Greek and the Hebrew. And the only Greek I knew was the guy that owned the fish and chip shop around the corner. <laughs> so I was not interested in all of this, you know, theoretical things about the Bible and, you know, how right it is and where it comes from, whatever. But, so I was not planning to go. Then when the day came... The fact is that I had nothing more exciting to do that day, actually. And so I decided, well, I'll, I'll go. I'll go with the man. Folks, I just want to tell you, 
I'm so thankful that somehow I think God dragged me there without me really knowing. But that day, apart from the day I met Jesus, that day, that day changed my life. Up till this day, it set something in, in place in my heart and my life that is still affecting me day, today as, as much as it did back there. As I listened to that man, a new world was unlocked for me. As he presented the Bible as more than a book, but actually as a living person. And I've never heard that before in my life. He introduced me to Jesus as the living word. And as a result, a seed fell in my heart that caused an incredible hunger to develop for the word of God, the Bible. I just couldn't get enough of it after then. I even read the Bible secretly in class at school. It's like, that must have been, that's where I lost the plot with the maths probably. But you know, they were busy in the front there. I was here. You know, when the teacher turns around, you go like, when she turns around again, she, okay, now I, I'm sure God has forgiven me for that. But I was desperate as a boy still in school just for the word. I couldn't get enough of the word of God because it became alive to me. It was no longer the black book on the shelf. That's kind of, oh, just names and stuff, you know. Thee and thou. I mean, what do we know about that? But then, as my life began to be filled with the word of God, for the first time really in my Christian walk, I saw significant change come to my life. An interesting thing, change began to appear in the lives around me of my family and my friends. And I made this major discovery. The word of God is alive. And it carries with it the power not only to change me when I engage with it, but also through me it begins to release a power that will change the people around me. Change, 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 change. We all want change. I'm not talking about 10 cents and 5 cents. Life change. Bad styles changed for better styles of living. I want to tell you, it will not fall from heaven. It comes through knowing and valuing the Word of God above all other books and inputs in your life. The Bible. And today I pray that you may somehow go on the same journey I've gone. I've never looked back ever in my life from that day. And I want to say to you, this book was not written for some professor in theology at some university to study. This book, this book, God wrote for you, for you. And if God wrote it for you, you better read it. Because he's got something to say to you that will change your life. Amen. I can just about say amen. And you say, that'll be good, then we can go home early. No, I'm not through yet. I want to introduce a few words to elevate the word with you today. These are the points I want to cover. They'll appear quickly on the screen, just overall. I want to talk about the authority of the word. You must know that this book is not just like any other book. I want to describe to you who the word is. Yes, the word is a living person. He's got personality. It is Jesus. I want to speak to you and, and lift up the trustworthiness of the word. You can bet your life on this word. I want to speak to you about what the word can do, the abilities it has, and then also what you need to do with the word. Very important. So that's what we'll go through today. But firstly, let me kick off by speaking about the authority of the word of God. And folks, the one thing I've learned in life is it's only as I give room in my life for something that it can affect me. If it's out there, I can take note and I can do that royal wave at it, say, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I like you. I see you. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and some of us have that distant kind of, you know, acknowledging the Bible. Kind of, we speak softly, let's see, reverently. But God says, I don't want it there. I want it here. And I want you to begin to realize that, that there's a tremendous authority in the Bible and it's for you to personally accept the word of God as the standard in your life. We allow many other things to set standards, some of them good, some of them bad. Our parents hopefully set good standards and values in our lives. Sometimes our friends set standards in our lives, not so good sometimes. But ultimately, what I'm calling you today is that you will exclusively reserve the right of what shapes your life to the Word of God. This is what must carry authority above everything else. Yes, even what people say to you. It's above all the laws of all the lands in the world and countries. This is the word by which God governs this universe. Then it must be able to also do something for your life and mine. Oh, I want you to submit your life under the authority of the word of God. I think one of the most arrogant things we can do in life is to think that this is a book of discussions or a book of suggestions. God says, well, you know, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you like this, you know, if you, if you find time, if you think, what are you talking about? Please do not handle the word of God with that attitude. This is not a book of suggestions. And so we need to understand what authority this carries. And I want to read a psalm to you a specific verse, Psalm 138, verse 2. And it says the following. Listen to the demeanor, the attitude of the psalmist that writes this. He says, I will bow down. That's how he starts. He's speaking from this place. He's not speaking from a, you know, a, no, no. He's speaking from a deep place of reverence. He says, I will bow down towards your holy temple. And I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. And then comes the punchline. For you have exalted above all things. Above all things. All laws, all kings, all rules, whatever he says. I've exalted, you've exalted above all things. Two things. Your name and your word. Ultimate authority in this universe belongs to Jesus and his word. Ultimate authority. Oh, we, we cannot lose sight of that. We must know that in this world, it doesn't matter what people say or history tells us, but the final say belongs to God. And it is as we bring every part of our lives, every part, from your thoughts right through to your finance, every part of your life, under God's word, that is where we can live a kingdom lifestyle. That's where we will experience life in its fullness and not live in a miserable life. Folks, what it's all about is learning that you'll find God's will in God's word. God does not mostly kind of send SMSs or speak with booming voice as you wake up in the morning, hey, wake up, this is God speaking on. We must do this. He doesn't do that. He has chosen and elected to speak mostly, mostly, mostly through his word. And therefore, we have to bring ourselves to a place where we can understand that if we want to know the will of God, in other words, how to live life, we have to open this word, bring it into our lives, and line our word up with his life, our life up with his word, rather. Please, please grasp this with me. You can say, in other words, that his word contains his will. The one thing I've learned about the authority of God's word is that actually God does know the best. We don't know the best. No human being actually knows the best for your life. God knows the best. And his plan is hidden, in a sense, 
in His Word, but hidden so that you can find it. That's wonderful to know. But it's, it's there for those who will seek to put themselves under its authority. God teaches us how to live His way in His Word. And it's for each believer to come to a place where you fully recognize the Word of God as the highest and final authority in this world. And that we don't argue with it. I meet people who's, who lives a Jacob kind of life. You know, Jacob wrestled with the angel, with God. And I, 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 I want to encourage you, don't go for a lifestyle where if God says something to you, then you wrestle with it for the next five years. I meet people like that. And you know what? While you're wrestling, it's very difficult to make progress. Kind of wrestling takes place locally. It's, it's in one spot. You can't kind of wrestle on the move. You know, it's difficult. <laughs> and what I mean by that just is I see Christians who never grow because they're still wrestling. God said, get baptized. God says, hey, wait, you know, I'm going on with, come on, yeah, I've got things for you. And they think they're walking with God. No, no, you're not walking with God. You're wrestling. Stop wrestling. And learn that when it comes to the word, it's that not there for us. It's arrogant, people, and I say this with respect to you, but it's arrogant to question God. On, yeah, but why? You know, and unless I have five scriptures, and you know, who says it? Why? And he, 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 stop it. Amen. And say, Lord, if you say it in your word, I will do it. Amen. I'll stop arguing. I'll put my mind under your word. Folks, one of the most Scary places to live is when you think that you're so clever you can actually help God. <laughs> I've had to repent at times. You know, no, I just, you know, why don't you do it this? You know, go do, do it this. God says, really? You know, I don't need your help. I made you and gave you a limited IQ. <laughs> you may think it's high, but it's limited. God has got no IQ. God is unlimited in his capacity. And don't be in that place of ignorance when God says something in his word, let's do it. Let's not fight about it and dissect it and get into a wrestling thing. And in that, we stunt our own growth. We don't go forward. And it's a very tiring place to live. I pray to God that today, right here, right now, quiet prayer in your heart, open eyes, you will just say, Lord, Forgive me for every place where I've resisted your word. And I was too clever. Today, Lord, I step back. And I say, Lord, if you say it in your word, I believe it. I'll take it and I'll make it part of my life. Amen. I trust that you will find that grace right now in your heart. Folks, the bottom line is that our lifestyles is governed not by the next fashion that we see on television, not the way your friends dress or do whatever, but our lifestyle is governed by the Word of God. We are Word people and proud of it. Word people. But let me continue to just for a moment focus on who is the Word that you can get maybe your perception of the Bible beyond that it's just a book. The Word is a person, not just a book. The Word is God and God is the Word. I don't know how that works. It's not as if God is contained in pages of paper, but His, his, his thoughts, His heart, His character is woven in this. And as you somehow engage with what's written here, you become aware that, that it's a person you're engaging with. And, and there's a scripture for every of these statements I make. So I will encourage you again and again, really by 12 o'clock Monday, if you don't have access to the internet, get some and go and get the sermon off because I've put lots of scriptures in here. And, and you need to make it a Bible study. This morning is a talk. It's not a Bible study because there's too many scriptures. We will be here past lunchtime. But go and get it off the internet and, and read it and study every scripture. But it says in John 1 that God is the Word and the Word is God. It goes on in John 1 to actually says that Word was manifested in Jesus as He came to earth. He was the living Word that came to earth. It also says that the Spirit and the Word is one. It's, it's, it's interwoven. It says that the Word is Spirit and life. 
It says that the word is alive. It's alive. It's, it's not a dead thing. It's not just paper. It's alive and powerful. That's in Hebrews 4 verse 12. Now, I want you just to be aware with me, and you're going to see a lovely picture now. Just, I, I like it because it's colorful. But that there's two components to the word of God. It's like a car. And in a car situation, you know, you have the structure, the, the, the chassis and the, the body parts and the wheels and, and hopefully an engine also in there. And, and that's one part. And that makes me think of this written word of God. It's structured. It, it's, it's there. It's, you, you, can, you can see it. But then, you know, there's another part to a car that it heavily depends on for movement. It's called the fuel. That's why it's got a tank. And you fill the tank with petrol, fuel. And, and, and it's on that fuel that, that, that it moves. And I liken that to the rhema word of God or the spoken word of God. But if you want to have proper vehicle movement, you need the vehicle and the fuel to come together. And so in our lives, we need to understand that we have to engage with two parts in God's word. We have to engage, firstly, with the written word. It also doesn't help you to have a, a, a little jerry can with petrol, you know, walk around. See, I've got petrol. Mm. That's Christians who have got no real basis in the word, but they've always got five prophecies and three scriptures that they can Kind of, you know, the morning, this morning I saw a pink octopus came to me and, and in a dream and then, and then Jesus appeared behind the octopus and, and there they go with their jerry can, but they've got no car. They've just got petrol in a can. Don't be a Christian like that. You scare us Christians. You flaky. Stop it. You need to have a basis in this word of God. The basic things, the structure needs to be there. When God says, repent and forgive people, you don't need to go and have a prayer meeting about it. So, oh, okay, show me a picture of how this works. Now, just do it. <laughs> you get it? And you get that in the Bible. Jesus says, if you don't forgive, I don't forgive you. Finish. That you get from the Word. You don't need to get, you know, a funny vision about it. So I'm asking you that in our lives, we will make room for this. We will firstly embrace, before you get the kind of the can with the petrol, just have a car. Get the basic structure of God's word, the things God likes and doesn't like into your life. And that's maybe putting it mildly. The things that God approve of and that he doesn't. The way he wants you to do life and the way he doesn't want you to do life. What he likes and doesn't like. And put it in your heart and in your mind. And then we can add the petrol of, oh, God spoke this. But I found still in my life, he mostly speaks the petrol part based still on his word. When people speak things and put it on God's account that you don't find here, don't go there. Don't go, even if they put before and after what they say, thus says the Lord. Don't go there. God mostly speaks still in reference back in and through his word. And all the mature Christians can now say, amen, Francois, that's true, that's right, yeah. Okay. But I want to hasten to go onwards with this message and say, my next point is to just confirm the trustworthiness, the trustworthiness of the word. You see, if you're saying to me, Francois, you must, you must put your whole life under this, what God says, then I want to know that this is kind of trustworthy. Do you agree with me? You want to know that, that this carries real weight and it's been tested and tried. Well, that's all I want to do is I just want to put three quick things up for you. Firstly, the Bible is inspired by God. And I know people, especially in the beginning in your faith, you go, think, oh, this is only people. This. And then I had one clever guy once say, you know, I have found where this contradicts. And, and, and he died miserable. Yeah, I, I, you know, let me not go there. But I want to ask you, understand that, that God inspired what is in here. It's God breathed. That's what we learn in the scriptures. And again, there's scripture for what I'm saying. Second point is, it's been purified according to the psalmist seven times. I don't, it's just so that you and I can know this is not a quick thing that was done. God took his time to put this together. It's been purified seven times like you purify gold and silver. It's gone through a crucible with God to come out and it's gold that you have in your hands. And thirdly, it's eternal. This word will outlive you. It's outlived every human being. 
The word of God stands forever. It doesn't ever grow old. Nothing of it changes. Nothing falls away. It will carry your life. You can let your whole life rest on God's word with full confidence. The word is trustworthy. But I hasten to go on, and this one, I'm just going to run through things. Your head might spin a little, but I want to end in a specific place with this. Great excitement. Well, Francois, you say a lot about the word this and the word that, but, but what can this word really do? Well, I've had to take three slides to put it on, and I've taken the scriptures out because that will take too long. But every one of them has got a scripture behind. But this is what the word can do. I'm going to run through it. The word has creative ability. God creates through his word. He spoke and things came into being. It's the word that causes us to be born again, the Bible says, because it's a seed of life. It's also what gives us deliverance. God sets free by his word. And as you encounter his word, it brings deliverance in your life. It sets you free from nonsense and patterns that held you. The, the word is able to deliver you. The word is a sword. It's amazing what warfare you can do with it. We win victories by when the word becomes our spoken language. It is also our belt that keeps everything together. Praise God, without that, I wanna tell you, your life will fall apart. But with the word in, it keeps everything together. The word brings healing. God says, I've sent my word and healed them. The word washes us. It sanctifies us. The word is also the antidote for sin. The more of the word that you have in you, the more you are immunized against sin. Mm, and there's scripture for this. Next slide. The word is the source of faith. You don't buy faith at the local supermarket. You get faith from engagement in the word. The word produces faith in us. The word is our source of wisdom and guidance. This is the basis of all wisdom that you will need in your life. It's right in this book. Oh, it's mwah. The word is also a tester and a separator. It puts distance between things that need to be separate. It's an amazing thing. It, 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 it puts a divider between nonsense and lies and the truth that you can live by. It's a tester and a separator. The word is a source of endless provision. It's the guarantee for fruitfulness and it's an open check from God in a sense. It's, it's amazing. I'm gonna quote that scripture later on in full. But the word is also our hope and our encouragement. The word is a book of love. It carries the most important message from God's heart. It's love. And the last couple, it's this. I want you to know that the word is so powerful, it sets angels in motion. Did you know that that's the job description of angels is the word of God? What they live for is to do the word. It's amazing. The word brings abundance and success. Thinking of Joshua, Joshua said, Man, I've got something now that, that can guide me my whole life. When God said to him, Joshua, if you keep to this word, if you, if you read it and keep it in front of you day and night. Do you remember that, Joshua? One? He says, whatever you put your hand to, Joshua, will be mildly okay. No, it says, will be successful. But it was based on the ability of the word. Folks, the word, according to Jesus, is the foundation of your life. I don't know what is the foundation apart from it. What? Your education? Your money? Folks, that's, those are shaking foundations. The word of God is the sure foundation of our lives. And lastly, but not the least, the word is the declared will of God. I always marvel at people who need to go and pray extra prayers to find the word of God for them while it's all actually written here. Let's not go there. But I think beyond all of these wonderful things that the word can do, maybe today even more important is for you and me to know what to do with the word. Now you know all of this, you hear all of this, Ooh, you think this is fantastic, you know, I'm gonna sleep with my Bible under my pillow now. Well, that, that, that won't do it. 
We need to know a few other things to do with the Word of God. And here's where the Life Changes course actually comes in, for instance. In the Life Changes course, we, we present some of the basic things that you need from the Word of God. It gives you the basic tools and you begin to have insight into the Word. I just had to get that in. So go for it. Come. Let us help you to begin to engage with the Word of God. But let me say a few things I see that God wants us to do with the Word. Firstly, He says you have to receive it. I'd like to encourage you today that, that some of you are living in a place where you window shop with the Word. You know, like when you press your, your nose against the, that window, you think, yeah, that's wonderful, eh? I want that. That's, you see, see that? Hey, lovey, come check this. Eh? You're a spectator. Let's move out of a place where we are spectators. The Word says, in terms of our attitude towards it, we've got to receive it. And it's freely available. That was one of the greatest discoveries back there for me as a young man. I always thought it was just for the clever people and those who knew Greek and Hebrew and whatever. And, and God says, no, I've written this for you. But then you must make the effort to come take it, receive it. It says that we must receive it with meekness. That's the condition. In other words, don't come with a critical mind. Yeah, well, you know, God, I just I have, a, I have a question here, page 572. You know, why are you... Uh, don't come with that attitude, it'll remain close to you. It says, receive the word with meekness. Meekness speaks of a ready and a soft heart that doesn't come with human wisdom to the God who created this world and who says, this is my word for you. It comes with a humility that says, I receive it. Paul wrote the following, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not a little, a lot. Richly means lot. Put the butter on thick. Thirdly, and I want to use a few times the word full, 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 so that you can hear that's the issue of today. We want to make this word our standard, that it fills our life, not that we have an occasional uh, little, you know, kind of a visitation with the word. But it says we have to fill our hearts by meditating on it. That means we give attention to read it and give it place in our hearts. We think about it. And we think some more. Practical things. I, I've seen many of my friends do it. And I've seen their lives change. And I've done it. Is, is begin to read the word. And even write it on little cards maybe. Put it in your pocket. Take it out time, ten times a day. Just, oh, yeah. By the end of the day, it's gone from head knowledge to heart experience. But find ways like that. And engage with the word. Fill your heart, your mind with it. Folks, it's the bread that your soul lives by. I ask you to fill your mind with the word. Many, many Christians become negative about what God can do in and through his word because they never allow for the word to renew their minds. In other words, we all have our opinions, don't we? And one of the most difficult things is sometimes to put your opinion down and to let God bring his conviction. There's a difference between opinions and convictions. The Holy Spirit brings convictions. We gather opinions. Yeah, you know, I experienced that, and the other day, you know, this, and now I believe this, and, you know. Well, maybe God's word says something different. Then your mind needs renewal. Don't let your experience speak louder than his word. Hello? Are you there? Many people's lives and their lifestyle is determined by what they experienced. Instead of saying, Lord, I will allow my mind to be renewed by your word. I want to think like you. That's important. And then, and it's so important, we will begin to fill our mouths with his word. Now, you don't have to speak in the old King James. That's scary. You don't have to kind of, you know, greet people when they say, hey, how are you? They say, the Lord is my shepherd. You don't have to. They, they lock you up. They'll think you're mad. But the issue is this, that what we say, what comes out of our mouths, must line up in principle with what God says. We don't have to quote scripture all the time. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to speak God's word. And we have to keep what we say in line with his heart and his principles in his word. And then, very important, I'm still on full, full. I've said, fill your heart, fill your mind, fill your mouth. Fill your prayers with God's word. 
pray the word. Don't pray the problem. God knows the problem. You know, God, I need 500 rand now on this, but uh, 500, you know, not, you know. Uh, uh, God knows that. But pray the word. Find what his word says about his promise of provision in your life. Pray that. You'll find it'll change your whole life. God says his word never returns to him empty. So remind him of his promises. You can shape your world by his word. His word, not your words. All of us have tried that. That doesn't work. And lastly, I want to say, fill your hands with his word. In other words, do it. The most dangerous thing is if you stop with the previous point. You know, I'm just, I speak, I mean, you know, God says, and you never do it. Please, if you don't plan to do God's word, don't speak it either. Because all you'll do is bring ill repute to the whole Christian faith. Do you understand that? Please don't do that. But let's do the word. Ultimately, God says it's doers that are blessed, not those who have all the revelations. I prefer people maybe who know less but do more than the guys that's read all the latest books, watched all the latest DVDs, and they always want to say, have you watched this DVD? Have you seen? Will you read this? And then I watch their lives, and they don't do one-tenth of it. I'd rather do five things that God says than know 200 things that I'm not doing. Hello? Mm. Please, make his word your final and highest authority. If God says it, love it and do it. Two scriptures I promised, I want you just to note this. Jesus makes this promise. With, it's an open check I refer to. In John 15 verse seven, he said, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you. In other words, it's not a visitation, it's not in and out, it's we, we grow into each other. He says, then you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now that, I, I'm glad I didn't say it. But I understand in the context God is saying, if my will becomes your will, then you won't ask for stupid things anyway. You won't ask for things to spend on yourself, in a sense. Your life will be absolutely given over with a passion for my word and my will to be expressed. And then when you ask, I will do whatever you ask me to do. Oh, may we all progress to reach that place. That his word has so renewed our minds, he's so filled our hearts, he's so evident on our hands that we live in this open blank check place with God. Oh, what an amazing place. The next slide is John 14, verse 21. And he just says this. He says, he who has my commandments, and I focused on this last week, and keeps them. Do you hear the hand spot? He's, he who has my word, my commandments, and keeps them. He says, it's he who loves me. Folks, let our love for God go beyond our words. Let it come to a place where it's known by the level to which we embrace his word and do it. It says, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him. And then comes the most amazing thing. I believe people who give the right priority to the word of God, that that orders their life and their decisions and their actions. Those people are the ones who can have the most realistic expectation of seeing Jesus, of experiencing his presence. Because that's what the word says. He says, that kind of person... I will manifest or show myself to. And I'm telling you it's the truth. It's God's word. So I want to begin to bring this to a close and I want to say the following to you. I encourage you to make a commitment today to read and engage with the word of God every day. Please, 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 please. Just, just nudge that neighbor and say, Every day, every day, every day, every day. We advise you to get a Bible reading program so that you can say, man, if there's one book I'm going to read every year, it's the Bible. And you need to become disciplined and fit in it. Um, just to, to say, we're going to help you with this. When you go to our website on Monday, at the bottom of the sermon, you'll find websites 
from which you can get Bible reading programs and Bibles free online and all the rest. But also in two weeks' time, we're going to give you a Z card. It's one of those that fancy folds out, folds out like this. And, and on it, there's going to be printing of a Bible reading program and a couple of these values and things to help you. And you can keep it in your pocket and, and keep your Bible ready and you can read. And know that in a year, you can cover the Bible. And you know what? It takes you about 15 minutes, one five Longer than most, or shorter than most soapies. <laughs> so you've got to decide, you know, like what's, you know, is it soapy or God? Word or soap? So, so, and, and I've never seen that that soap ever cleanses anybody, but that's just by the way. But, um, uh, Steve, and I'm challenging you, I am. You cannot say, well, I, I, I don't know, God doesn't answer me, my life's not coming together, I have no power and God doesn't anything. But just say, listen, how much time do you spend with the word? No, well, you know, you know, I've been, uh, uh, you know, I've been, uh, I've been sick, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Folks, it's much like athletes in training. An athlete in training. And any athlete who wants to compete and wants to do well gets a training program. That's why we want to give you a Bible reading program. It's a training program for your spirit. And so we need to get into a lifestyle around this value of becoming fit in the word. The, your inheritance is locked up here. I bet you with all of my life, if, if this was a rich uncle that you learned that died and he had no children and the only one that's going to inherit is you, you would be at the lawyer's office tomorrow morning, six o'clock waiting, say, okay, yeah, I'm ready. What, what did I get? God says, I've written 6,000 promises here for you, for you. It's yours, it's yours. And some are saying, no, I'm, not, I'm a bit busy. I'll come check it out next year. No, no. Get into the word. This is God's legal document of what you've inherited. But you'll find it in here. You don't need a lawyer to interpret it. The Holy Spirit is there. He says, I'll teach you. But then open it, read it, get into it, love it. And if you get to the difficult place of the names and it frustrates you, skip it. But don't stop. You hear me? Please don't stop. Folks, this does not only apply this fitness program to reading the word, but I would like to extend it once again to the fuel part. We need to give our ears that as God begins to speak, and I must just say this to you, the more of his written word I got into my heart, it seems to me the easier the Holy Spirit could begin to draw from that and speak to me. Hello? Do you understand? It's crucial. I want to say it again. The more I got of the written word in my heart, the easier I found the Holy Spirit has got a basis to speak from. It's like if you have no money in the bank, it's difficult to withdraw. Mm -hmm. But if you've banked something in the heart, then the Holy Spirit can say, yeah, you know, uh, this and this. But let's give ourselves to listen to the Holy Spirit because He wants to speak. Our God is a speaking God. He's not a silent idol. He's a speaking God. So listen and give yourself to become fit in that as well. So I'm going to begin to listen what God wants to say to me. I want to close with a testimony and then a last scripture. I heard a story long ago, and I've shared it many times, but he always enthuses and challenges me. Of an old man that lived outside a village on his own, and he would get into the village only from time to time to buy groceries and get his mail. And as he got to the post office that day to fetch his mail, there was a young lady that had just started working there, and she'd never seen him before. And, and he greeted her, and she greeted him. And, and, and as he walked out, that was all she said to the people in the post office walking with, uh, working with her, they, she said, wow, who's that man? There's, he's shining. There's, there's something about him. They said, oh, he's a, he's a man of God. He's a Christian. She said, but I, I know many Christians. They don't all look like that. And they said, oh, he's got a testimony to his life. And his life guideline is this. He's living by this rule in his life. You want to get it? I'm drawing this out. Here it comes. He says, his rule of life is no Bible, no breakfast. That's not rocket science. But what it says is that he said, if my physical body 
needs to get food every day, certainly my spirit and my soul that will live forever, that will determine who I am, needs to get its portion of bread every day. He said, before I feed my body, no, bacon and eggs, I feed my spirit. Now, I want to tell you, I don't do that exactly that way, but there's just about never a day in my life since that day that I don't engage with God's word. And it's not that I'm so smart. It's that his word is so powerful. I'm asking you, how about following in that footsteps to say, no Bible, no breakfast. Or at least I'm not ending a day without at least spending 10 or 15 minutes or whatever. Just say, God, I just want to get your word in. Speak to me, Lord. I'm listening. Oh, your life will never be the same and will become hugely powerful as it's shaped by God's word. Allow the word of the God to penetrate every area of your life. God has got to say something about your children, something about your work, something about your health, something about your heart, something about the future. God has got something to say, and it's in his word. But allow him to bring his word into your heart. Let me introduce you to the final picture of the word as the living word. It's found in Revelation 19, Verse 11 to 16. Check the screen. I want you to see that magnificent animal there. And I only chose it because it's in the first verse that it speaks about a white horse. But more so it speaks about the rider of that white horse. And it says, in the end of days, there will be a massive revelation of Jesus riding on a white horse. And it goes like this. John was seeing this in the spirit. He says, Revelation 19 verse 11, I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on him that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. That's his name, the rider of that horse. And he says, and the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed his white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he would himself rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe, I don't know exactly where, and on his thigh, it is written, King of kings, Lord of lords. I want to ask you today, to what measure are you filled with the word? Pictured glass? Are you like just a little bit here? Are you half full? Or are you overflowing? Let's go there. What is your word measure? Do you treat the word of God as optional as suggestions, or do you embrace it with conviction? Now, I challenge you today that we will begin to submit every part of our lives under His Word. Ask Him, Lord, what is your Word for this situation? Lord, what do you want to do here? Lord, how do I do that? Let's not live by preference, but by conviction based on the Word of God. I ask you today that if there's a discrepancy between what you believe in your heart, say with your mouth, and do, different from his word, then you must know you will suffer from power outages. But the life where the heart is filled with the word, the mind is ordered by his word, the mouth is filled with his word, and the hands show the evidence of his word, that is where you will find God's power in its fullness. That's where we want to go. There must be agreement, harmony in our lives between all these areas based on the word of God. It's my prayer today, it's I'm gonna pray now, that God will open your eyes and your understanding for the wonders of his word. And in two weeks time, we'll give you 
those cards and you can start to get fit. Please join me in this prayer to say just in your heart the following. Lord, I put my life under your word. Holy Spirit, I give my hearing to hear your voice. And Lord, as I begin to journey with your word daily, I will allow your word to shape my thinking, my convictions, fill my mouth, and that it will become my guideline for every action I take. I will live and order my life according to your word. I accept it, Lord, as an absolute value in my life. Lord, now I pray for your precious people that you will open the eyes of their understandings for the wonders of your word. I pray that a deep love will rise up within each one of them for your word, the living word, the rider of that white horse. I want to say one last thing. You're welcome to open your eyes. Take a last look at that horse. I don't know about you, but by God's grace, I plan to ride in that army one day with him. And you know what's the qualification? Is that you ride as a rider with the word of God as your sword and in your heart. Then saddle up. We're going to ride. God bless you as you love his word. Let praise reside.